So it's a great pleasure to be today with Dr. Jim File. Um, Jim is a colleague who I've been working with for many, many years. Uh, he originally trained as a chiropractor and as a polarity therapist and has also worked extensively in the field of craniosacral biodynamics um, and was also a very close student of Stanley Kellerman, one of the pioneering sort of founding fathers of body-centered approaches to psychotherapy. And out of that, Jim has developed a kind of a, a, his own system, a synthesis of a number of these different influences that he's calling formative embodiment that he's now teaching in various places around the world. Um, and um, we're just gonna have a, a little chat about a seminar that Jim is going to be offering here at the Craniosacral Therapy Educational Trust in London. Uh, it's, uh, the seminar is gonna be available to attend in person or live online on May the 18th to the 21st uh, this year. Um, so Jim, thank you so much for joining me today. And you, um, the, the, the name that you're giving for this uh, seminar is the nervous system as a non-linear network, um, doorways to deeper therapeutic interactions. And I'm curious, why the word non-linear? What's the significance of the word non-linear? Well, non-linear is a, is a word that you can look at from a number of different perspectives. Obviously, it's a, it's a scientific word um, tied into, uh, you know, quantum mechanics and, and, um, and, and uh, but not just that, but the nonlinearity is also a mathematical term. But what my, perhaps my greatest interest in is as a, an experiential term, right? Uh, the the nonlinearity um, that that can be experienced and what it means to experience things in a nonlinear way as opposed to in a linear way where there seem where there seems to be a causal sequence and um, and a lot of studies show that nonlinearity is really much more uh, a description of certainly about how a lot of the the nervous system functions and how it puts together a world, right? We, of course, have to put together an, a continually adopting, shifting, complex world. And it takes a lot of elasticity and, and a lot of openness. And of course, billions, if not trillions of neurons and, and cells to kind of put all this together. And, um, so that there is a, a, a quality of adapting to the shifting, changing world, which on one level needs to be incredibly open and incredibly diverse, and on another level needs to support a continuity and a stability. And anyway, that's kind of a bit of a long uh, statement, of, but, but I had certain experiences personally, which seemed to be very nonlinear and in experiencing a certain nonlinearity, which is you know really the, at the source of creativity, for example, and of associational logic versus normal logic, uh, I had really big transformations in my life and in my way of thinking, you know. And sometimes it comes on unexpectedly, right? I was once at a lecture where this uh, speaker was, he was a chiropractor, talking about chiropractic. And it, and it was a pretty unmemorable talk, except that at one point he says, well, you know, the founders of chiropractic say that it's a science, a philosophy, and an art, you know, as three different, uh, you know, foci. And that statement set off you know, I don't know, an epiphany in my brain where all of a sudden I didn't see them as categories. I saw a potentially new language, integrative language, in which the the categories and the, you know, the boundaries of these modes of knowledge 
disappeared instantly. And my brain just suddenly said, I have a new language, a new way of thinking. And, and it was, a, you know, it was non-linear, non-logical, but I went through a, a really quite a, both an, a nervous state and my whole body kind of embodied something. I was tingling and my whole sense of how to put together language for experience changed. So, you know, that was just one of many, what I would call non-linear moments where you go through a, a mental, emotional, you know, bodily shift, you know, um, and something new forms. Yeah. And, yeah. And you mentioned earlier on that this, um, this process is not so much to do with causality. It's, it kind of takes us out of the, the kind of the linear domain of cause and effect. Can you explain a little more? How does it change that? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, uh, you, we can, uh, there's a lot of interesting material on it, both from neurologists, neuroscientists, and physicists, and then from people like Kellerman, who talks a lot about this kind of non-linear uh, mode of thinking, you know, um, or experiencing. And it's as if, you know, what happens is that, you know, we, we like to think that there, there's a cause, and then that cause has very, you know, trackable consequences. And then I'm such a mess today because of what happened, you know, at my birth or early in childhood, and, you know, and there's a certain, it's a certain classical vision of how things develop, right? And the classical vision is that there are forces and, you know, which, which act on objects and those forces have implications. So it's classical physics and, and then they lead to a certain event. And that really sits within, to a great extent, within our whole, uh, the therapeutic and the psychological profession you look for the cause and then you can just track that all the way to the present moment you know of course that trajectory is filled with so much experience so much additional information and association uh, so much you know personal history and and experiences that can somehow change and modify that initial cause that um it just seems a certain like a certain limited way of 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 holding our experience now Kellerman he said you know of course we are we do live to a certain extent in a Newtonian world a classical world we also live in an Einsteinian world where everything is very relative in the equals e and mc squared and we live in a quantum world and he says so when you begin to to bring all of those perspectives into uh, you know the body as an embodying process engaging all those perspectives you need a much more open field of appreciating what's going on in a client what's forming their experience than just tracking a specific causal chain, which is still might be useful, but limited. So I don't know if that describes a little bit of what, you know. In, in a way, Jim, what I'm getting is, you know, that there's a kind of, you know, it, it's a very big, can I say, philosophical vision um, that you're holding here that, that seems very inclusive of both linearity, but also of what's beyond linearity. I'm wondering how do you make that big vision uh, usable in therapeutic practice? How can it actually make a difference in people's therapeutic interactions by being able to kind of shift? What sort of, um, not only what perceptual shifts or philosophical shifts can perhaps people expect to learn if they come onto your class, um, but what kind of skills could they come away with that may help them to deepen into their practices? Great. Well, you know, it's a philosophical statement, but it's a statement very much tied into experience 
and the pro the the actual process of forming as a human being, right? Because we go from conceptus to mature adults, right? There is a whole kind of process of forming, um, which has many layers to it, complex. And um, so the the model, kind of this vision of, of uh, you know, uh, formativeness, you know, with with all with this kind of like you mentioned, this very big space that it creates. Well, it tells us what we need to track what's going on in a client's story and in their process with a much wider tracking uh, kind of frame. Yeah. And that um, the things get put together uh, in very unusual ways, you know, and so that even as a person is telling their story, you know, for example, somebody will tell me that person drove me crazy. Well, of course, this gesture is a very physical expression of a massive historical process. First, it's a, you know, it's a complex expression motorically, complex expression neurologically, but it holds a whole history. And somehow that whole history came together in a gesture. And it, and so it, and that, you know, that gesture and in, indicates a state that I'm in and a shape to my experience. And, you know, if you can do some reverse engineering mm -hmm. and begin to disorganize the shape that has been organized, you deconstruct it, right? And, you know, there are actually uh, some interesting theories about how emotion is really constructed out of experience much more than as a reflex. But there is a whole process of deconstructing that takes us back into a much more fluid, motile world where other expressions and other ways of dealing with experience can emerge very creatively um uh rather than programmed yeah as as many therapies are so are you getting you know are you teaching practitioners how to observe these kinds of shapes these kinds of gestures and then do some kind of exploration of what's behind the gesture is this what you're saying yeah i mean i you know as i describe it it sounds as you say maybe a bit more philosophical but it's a very experientially based process right where first of course we we do exercises to track our own forming process how do how do, does our experience form in the moment in specific situations right that the 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 process of responsiveness to anything can be tracked at ever more micro levels we tend to see things from a very macro perspective what do i feel wow what's the sensation what's the movement what's the action we live in a macro world and yet things get constructed you know in a very micro world where the logic is different it's a different scale mm -hmm. And you start moving maybe out a little bit out of the Newtonian classical world into the rel relativity world and into a bit more of a of a of a really nonlinear entanglement process. And it's actually you know it's, a, it's something we can track as we work with people. So of course you know we slow them down. Right, but it's not just in slow. It's also the slowing opens up feedback circuits, right? In terms of what am I doing? And you start to listen to yourself very differently. And a whole other world of feeling and sensation begins to emerge, which gives you new information. And your whole massive nonlinear nervous system with all of its resources begins to put things together very differently 
in ways that your conscious intelligence could never imagine. And I see this constantly, that people begin to find other ways to solve their issues and organizes their responses to life, not by just running through the uh, a more conscious kind of process, but by tracking this micro world, which is very present, very immediate, and something that can be learned and and in that tracking process jim and and what you're teaching people to do if if, if I, I just wanted to are, are, are we looking as it were for the spaces you know as, when you slow it down and you explore those shapes and those gestures and you know are we looking for the perhaps would you say we're looking for the spaces in which different choices could be made or different responses could be accessed yeah that's i mean that's exactly right there is in the pauses Kellerman has something he calls middle ground it's a pause place and in that pause place it's also a transitional place right because the pause place you're no longer doing what you're conventionally doing what you're habitually doing it's a and and it's a pet place of potential of possibility and all kinds of other resources come into that place which again can provide feedback and information which aren't just consciously used but the whole the whole system begins to go ah this is a much more efficient and comfortable and effective way to respond to my experience because the body in a sense has that formative intelligence and wants to form itself it's a version of the health is never lost right it wants to form itself in the most effective fullest way that it can right that's what it's moving towards you know uh, an apple is going to grow towards ripeness if given half a chance. So an apple is not going to grow towards being a sour, ugly. It's going to grow into its fullest expression of ripeness. And we have, you know, metaphorically speaking, we have the same formative intelligence in us that is that knows what we can be as a biological being for sure but then also as a social being that supports that if we create the conditions for for those deeper forms to emerge so there's a deep shape that one not a deep state but a deep shape that wants to emerge from us if we you know begin to support it and remove obstacles to that. So um, people, you, you, from what you're saying is, is that you, you think these tools, these skills can just assist practitioners, therapists from a number of different somatic backgrounds, or even just in their personal journey to find new perspectives, new approaches towards health, towards yeah reconnecting to that formative impulse that as you say is is completely innate completely natural yeah i i believe so i mean i've done enough sessions over the years to see some very interesting kind of shifts uh it's very efficient sometimes sometimes you get to the core of something surprisingly quickly and efficiently yeah with this work because you are engaging what we're calling this innate formative intelligence which is right there looking for every opportunity to organize something that not just survival oriented but but really supports our our fullest development and and so part of the work is to engage that formative intelligence um, and it has great creative power um, and great resolution power. So it is. I think it's a it's a a way of working. As Kellerman said, it's not just a methodology. It's literally a function 
of the whole system. We're engaging certain functions that when they take charge, they grow us and we can influence them, we can participate in them, but we want to engage that powerful knowing in us as to how it wants to grow us. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I've had the great pleasure of working with you, I think almost for like a 30, 35 year period. I've certainly sure. seen a lot of fantastic results and transformations through the work that you've been doing over the years. So um, really invite uh, friends and colleagues to come and join you, maybe 18th to the 21st. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, let's uh, just be in touch. And uh, I hope to uh, I hope to see some of you in the class. So thank you so much, Jim, for joining me today. Thank you, Michael. Great. All right.